Hey guys, welcome to week eight of our CYAA House Church series, Walking Through the Book of James. Today we're going to be in chapter four. We're going to start in verse one and go through verse 10. And today I want to read out of the New Living Translation. So let's look at it together. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get what you want because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him, and he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. I know that ends really heavy, but as I was thinking about this scripture, this, this memory came back to me of something that reminds me sort of what James is saying here. When I was at kids camp, I was probably about maybe 10 years old, and there was a small amount of us that got to go to kids camp because we were a pretty small church at that time, and there were, I think, maybe two or three of us girls who got to go, so we had to bunk with another church in a room. And there was one girl in particular from the other church who was dead set on winning the game of kids camp. And so she started cheating in order to get more points for our team's color so that we would win. And I caught her cheating one time. And so I told our our, um, camp director, hey, this, this girl's like going about it all the wrong way. She's cheating. Well, this camp director was missing a few brain cells. So she decided to go and tell that girl that I had said that she was cheating when she confronted her. So she like ratted me out to this girl. So we went up this hike and while we are on our descent, this girl decides she's going to take me out. So she literally jumps on my back and she's got me in a choke hold because I told somebody that she was trying to cheat in order to get ahead in the game because this girl was adamant that our team was going to win. And thank goodness the counselor turned around at the time that she had a choke hold on me. She got in big trouble. But man, when when James is talking about our willingness to fight and to wage war and to go to the extreme of even maybe trying to choke someone out so that we get what we want, so that we get ahead. That is exactly what this reminded me of, this girl jumping on my back and trying to put me in a chokehold just because she wanted to win some dumb little camp game. And sometimes we do the same kind of things in our lives. And that's what James is talking about here. He's saying, you want all these things that the world has to offer, but come on guys, they are so temporary. They are a temporary replacement. And quite honestly, sometimes they're just playing out juvenile things that we want and that we are striving for. They're a replacement for the things that only the Lord can truly give us the things that are eternal, the things that last. And so he makes two points here. And the first thing is that he's saying, well, I want you to be in the world, but not of the world. Maybe you've heard that Christian phrase before, in the world, but not of the world. Technically, 
that is not in the Bible anywhere at all. It is a reference to 1 John chapter 2 where, where John is talking about being Christians who live in the world but represent Christ. We are, we are pursuing different things than the world, but yet to the world we represent Christ. But um, there's a, a lustfulness and allure that the world has that'll tell you like you need this size house or you need this kind of car or you need to be in a relationship that's like this, not because it's actually honoring to God, but because it will make you feel good. We hear so much of that today in culture. Just do what makes you feel good. Do what makes you happy. And James is telling us here, hey, that's actually just a downward spiral. Because pretty soon, somebody's going to do something that offends you. Somebody's going to get something that you think was yours. And eventually, it gets to the point where you would stop at nothing to make it yours. Or you would stop at nothing to make sure that that person knew that you feel they'd wronged you. And so, he's saying, you've walked away from your first love. He's saying, you adulterers, you have walked away from the person who created you. You've walked away from the one you were designed to have a relationship. You've broken that union with Christ and you've cheated on him with the world. What does that feel like? If if you think about the friend who only comes around when they want something from you. Or think about all the times you see that name pop up on your phone, the friend that only calls um, when they have something going on in their lives and they want you to give your energy to the problem that's going on in their life. You see that name pop up on your phone and you're just like, ugh, like I don't even want to talk to that person because it's all about them. It's all about the things that they want and they just want something from me. And that's kind of what James is saying here. He's saying God's not going to be used as a candy dispenser where you just say a little prayer, you turn a little knob, and then maybe I'll get the toy out of it that makes me happy, the one that I want. God is not like that. James is reminding us that our scripture says that God is passionate about the spirit he's placed within us, that it would be faithful to him, that it would love him first, far and above everything else. He is the God of the universe. He's holy and perfect. He's strong and mighty. Scripture says that it is by him, through him, and to him that all things were made. It is his word that put the chaos into order and his breath that gave life into Adam's body first. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to stand before Steve Jobs and the creator of all these Apple products to give an account for the priorities of my life. At the end of the day, I'm going to stand before God. And the things in this world will have passed away. I cannot take them with me, but I will stand before God and give an account for the priorities of my life. And guys, we are all guilty. Every single one of us are guilty at some point of misaligning our priorities. So then the question is, what do we do about it? And this is the second thing that James shows us. He shows us that we are to come humbly before the Lord. So what does that look like? What does it look like to come humbly before the Lord? It is not hard to humble ourselves when we remember His greatness and our dependency on Him, our dependency on everything about who He is. So we come close to the Lord, and James promises us that as we come close, He comes close in return. I love this. What James is saying here is that the Lord does not delight in punishment He's not like, no, you got to come the full way. You got to make the full trek. You got to get everything right to come to me before I'll even respond. Now, James is saying, if you just start to come close to the Lord, he will come close to you because he doesn't delight in punishment. He delights in restoration. And then he says, wash your hands 
I love that, especially in a time of COVID, we are well familiar with washing our hands. And guys, there is just nothing quite like that feeling of when you've gone through like an airport terminal. I just got done traveling or maybe you've been touching some doors here and there and you just feel like, gosh, my hands are covered in nastiness and you go and you're washed to your hands. There's just nothing like that feeling of it's clean. It's safe. There's nothing, there's nothing bad here. And so he's saying, wash your hands, you sinners. There's something so satisfying to being clean. And then he says, repent. So don't make excuses for the priorities that got misaligned, but recognize, acknowledge the sorrow and give it to the Lord. But then be really careful not to go back looking for things that make that sorrow feel better because that would be the easy thing to do. To be like, man, I really hate this feeling of getting it wrong, so I'm just going to go and I'm going to go enjoy this thing in the world or I'm going to go do this because, well, that makes me happy. No, come before the Lord and acknowledge, acknowledge where we've gotten it wrong, but then let the Lord be the one who lifts you up. And I love what James says at the end of this, that he doesn't just lift us up and put us back on our feet. No, he does it with honor. Because that's what the Lord does. He restores with honor. He restores with dignity and he restores with kindness. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that it is your kindness that leads us to repentance. Lord, we ask you to search our hearts and our lives. Show us any place or anything that we have exalted above your holy and your worthy name. Lord, give us a heart of humility and come near to us, Lord, as we run towards you. We thank you for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.